Hi everyone, I'm Jason Tentor, and thank you, you've made it to the last presentation of the day. <laughs> I, realize, I realize that some of you have been introduced to each other, but if everyone can humor me for a few seconds, I would like for everyone to introduce themselves simultaneously. On the count of three, I would like everyone to say, Hi, my name is your name, pleased to meet you. So it sounds like, Hi, my name is Jason, pleased to meet you. On the count of three, ready, okay? One, two, three. Hi, my name is Jason, pleased to meet you. Okay, given my time constraint, that may have been uninformative, but it was efficient. Let's get right into it. Everyone, meet my avatar. Nice suit. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason's avatar during the first half of this presentation. I'll be asking a key question around Jason's relational art capstone. What is relational art? Relational art is a still emerging movement around since the early 1990s in which contemporary artists use interactive and performative techniques that respond to the engagement of audience participants. French art critic Nicolas Boriat was the first art theorist to recognize and write about this type of engagement and what he termed relational aesthetics. Okay, so why are you talking to a video of yourself? Because relational art brings interrelations into focus. By interacting with the video of myself, I bring into question the nature of human relationships and the lack thereof. In a developed world populated with internet similar chrome and electric stimuli, society seems to devalue in-person interactions. My relational art practice takes back my own expressive agency and relates how I counter mediated passivity with active performance. What did Boriad observe? Boriad witnessed that the distance between artists across disciplines and the average citizen were collapsing. No longer was art simply being displayed in museums and galleries or telling stories at people because the institutions of art were losing importance. The spectators were privileged to co-create the story of the art with the artist. Boriad observed a significant turn in context and meaning of the works that challenged the constrictions of museums, stages, and performance halls. Boriad blames technology for replacing ordinary human interaction. Relational art is an alternative to electronic communication. How do you view these audience spectators? The term spectators was borrowed from the theater of the oppressed to signify an audience member that has the power to impact the performance at any point. Much of the performances are unmarked. My performance are unmarked as art, per se, like as artist, author Adrian Piper writes about interventions that she says seeks to avoid the production of an audience versus performer separation, which occurs in the announcement of an event. My work is based around the temporal and transient nature of the sidewalk. I am partly in agreement with Alan Capra when he writes about the Happenings Art Movement in the late 1950s in New York. He says, there is an exception, however, to the happenings to participants only. When a work is performed on a busy avenue, passerbyers will ordinarily stop and watch just as they might watch the demolition of a building. These are not theater goers, and their attention is only temporarily caught in the course of their normal affairs. They might stay, perhaps become involved in some unexpected way, or they will more likely move on after a few minutes. Such persons are authentic parts of the environment. In my words, these persons, however, are not the intended committed participants of capital's happenings who have a clear idea of what they are to do. The spectators involved in my work are not required to know what to do in an art intervention. Failure is just one of the general outcomes of a performance, and my production team does not expect participants to follow relational to the letter. Do you have an example? Yes, I do. <laughs> in a letter entitled the Pioneer Square Investment Institute, or PSII, I offer dollar bills sheathed in plastic protector slips on a folding table for the price of 57 cents to 75 cents. Respondents knew only half the time how to engage profitably with my intervention. Then, when they were able to identify the objective of the game, the participant questioned my motives, asking why I was doing this. Moments like these are what Boriad identifies as relational interstices, a word originally coined by Karl Marx, to describe trading communities that escape the framework of the capitalist economy, such as barter, selling at a loss, our target forms of production. PSII was an interstice, 
a space for social relations and which suggests possibilities for exchanges other than those that prevail within the system. Borean writes that relational works like these or contemporary art exhibitions create free spaces and periods of time whose rhythms are not the same that organize everyday life and they encourage an interhuman intercourse which is different to the zones of communication that are forced upon us. Who are some of your primary sources of inspiration? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the anti-art, anti-data movement of the early 20th century provides the groundwork for several of my projects. Artist Marcel Duchamp entered the first ready-made into an art show in 1917. A urinal turned upside down and signed with the name of a cartoon, R. Mutt. Duchamp described that his intent with the piece was to shift the focus of art from physical craft to intellectual interpretation. Nearly 100 years later, I'm using what artist author Peter Weibel titles cultural ready-mades. These are behaviors, fantasies, attitudinal cliches. One key element in all the cultural ready-mades used in my work is that they all pre-exist the project that uses them. Artist Rick Fit Terabania, similar to relational art, as putting Duchamp's fountain back on the wall and pissing into it and hopefully others are pissing in it as well. As crude as the similitude is, it directs attention to the active element in relational art that has the potential to take static work off the wall of the museum and use it in real time. The object of relational art occupies a lower status within Moriart's theoretical framework. It is a conversation starter that ushers in the privileged aspect of relational art, the interaction between participant and participant or artist and participant. What do you mean the fabric of interaction is the medium for your art? The answer to this refers back to art critic Nicholas Boriad, who states that the relational art is an art that is taking as its theoretical horizon the realm of human interaction and its social context, rather than the assertion of an independent and private symbolic space. This means that the available material for my work is exhausted only when a possible new interrelation cannot be reimagined. What are the limitations or criticisms of relational art? Claire Bishop's famous criticism of the work of several artists supported by Borida raises the question of the character and the quality of intersubjective relationships that arise in such socially engaged artworks. The issue is essentially ignored by Borida. Bishop argues that the mere social structure of an artwork encouraging intersubjective interaction often leads to trivial, self-satisfied art which circumvents truly political issues and is not in of, in of itself democratic. Bishop argues that effective relational art should provide a more concrete and formidable grounds for rethinking our relationship to the world and to the other. Bishop views social inequality, poverty, and exploitation as among the issues that should be, should be taken up by relational artists. What does Boriad say about all this? Boria claims that relational aesthetic work is political when it attempts to move into the relational sphere by problematizing it. He argues that contemporary social context restricts opportunities for interhuman relations and that it creates spaces designed for that purpose. The machinations that police and sanitize social functions are gradually reducing our relational freedoms. My work situates itself in between Boria's generous theoretical neck and Bishop's demand for relational accountability between the intersection of cultural theory and performance. Enjoy the rest of the presentation. Bye-bye. <laughs>
I found this claim, like many other electronic information, to be completely ridiculous. So the ridiculousness of this robot was meant to mirror that of the news station. It's a very dotted gesture. During the performance, I handed out the scene that you have in front of you on the table. You can take a look at that. It's like a coloring book. Uh, just join the tea party. During the summer months of 2012,